So there are many teachings in our faith, and I think as Catholics, uh, we very rarely have a, a good scriptural backing, a good scriptural foundation for what we believe. Uh, it's not really the way our faith is taught. So we're rarely taught we believe this because the Bible says X, Y, and Z. So at times then, it can be very easy, as we've mentioned earlier this week, uh, to, to knock a Catholic off their Catholic horse uh, by saying, where does it say that in the Bible? It's a common kind of a thing. Uh, if we're ever in, in discussion with any of our, our Protestant brothers, that they'll say, well, where does it say it in the Bible? And invariably, we, we don't know. <laughs> it's, it's, as I say, it's not the way we learn our faith. It, we should. We should have a much better scriptural basis for what we believe, but it can, it just the way, the way catechesis has, has developed, uh, we don't know scripture well enough, unfortunately, as Catholics. So, as we said at the beginning of Mass, this whole month, right, for the Holy Souls, and this day in particular, in particular, uh, this day of yesterday all saints, today all souls, we pray for the faithful departed, all of this hinges on this one particular teaching, uh, and that is the belief in the existence of purgatory. Because if those who die, if they all go to heaven, they don't need our prayers. Uh, if some who die are going elsewhere, our prayers can't help them. So there's, it's, it's kind of one of the other, either purgatory is there or it's not. And if it's, if it's there, then our prayers, our prayers for the, de the deceased make sense. If purgatory isn't there, our prayers for them are useless. So it's very important that we have a good scriptural basis for the existence of purgatory. Uh, now, there's, there are the word purgatory, as, as with a lot of the terms that we use uh, typically in our faith, those words as terms don't necessarily appear in scripture. Right? So we have, to, we, have to, we have to kind of roll with it, okay? Because at, at times there's, there's the existence of a place, a spiritual reality, uh, after this life that we're trying to describe with human words and also trying to describe it then through different languages and different cultures who have different understanding of, of these things. So like Hades in Greek, the realm of the dead, Sheol in, uh, in Hebrew, the realm of the dead, uh, you know, purgatory, like all of these, trying to get terms across languages isn't easy either. So this, it's a bit of a minefield, basically is what I'm trying to say, uh, to try and, try and uh, come, come up with terms for these things. But scripture, does clearly state, uh, does clearly speak about praying for those who have, whose lives have ended here. Uh, so whatever term we want to put on it, in whatever language, they speak about uh, a reality after this where there's a place of purification, or they speak about the need to pray for our deceased. So the first one we look at today is just, just an Old Testament reading from the uh, second book of Maccabees 12.39, if you want to look at it yourselves afterwards. So there had, there had been a battle, and the Maccabees, so the tribe of the Maccabees, recognized that some of the soldiers had had amulets, kind of good luck charms, to other gods in, in, their, in their clothes. So the fallen soldiers that they, that they came across, when they were uh, removing the bodies, they, they found these, these uh, basically idolatrous uh, trinkets. And there was a call out by Judas Maccabees to pray for those who had fallen uh, because he said they had died as punishment for their sin. Therefore, Judas and his men turned to prayer beseeching that the sin, remember these, so they're praying for people who have died. Remember, this is very normal and ordinary for us, but it says in scripture that Judas and his men turned to prayer beseeching that the sin which had been committed might be wholly blotted out. He also took up a collection and sent it to Jerusalem to provide for a sin offering. Okay, so they prayed for the deceased, these Jewish brothers of ours. They prayed for the deceased, and they made a sin offering for them. So the idea of praying for those who, who have passed away, it's, it's in Scripture. Now, slight caveat there, Protestants don't accept the book of Maccabees as, or the books of Maccabees as divinely inspired, so they'll say that one doesn't count. Okay, let's move on. Uh, Matthew 5, uh, in the... The Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is very clearly speaking about heaven and hell and mortal sins and venial sins and the different kinds of sins. And so it's, it's a very eschatological conversation. Okay, he's, speaking, he's not speaking about moral behavior in general, but about heavenly realities and what we're called to after this life. 
in that context, and the context is important, he says, make friends quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and your judge to the guard, and you will be put in prison. Truly, I say to you, you will not get out until you've paid the last penny. So remember, the, the context here is important. He's speaking about hell and heaven. He's speaking about uh, sin. So he's not saying, and by the way, pay your bills. You know, uh, the context here is we're speaking about, as I say, eschatological realities, uh, uh, what happens after this life. So he's saying, you will, not get, you will not get out. So you will get out, but you will not get out until you've paid the last penny. Incidentally, the same word for prison uh, that's used there is the word that uh, St. Peter uses when speaking about Jesus descending into hell or the dead, depending on the translation. It's the same word. So Jesus descends into the prison, right? It's this holding place, temporary holding place for the dead. Okay, so... That's, uh, that's Matthew 5. And the last one we'll take today, because I don't want it to be too complex, uh, is St. Paul, his first letter to the Corinthians. So chapter 3, verse 11, again, if you want to look it up afterwards. Okay, and it says, For no other foundation, for no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation, with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, each man's work will become manifest when the day for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. So we have fire testing the work that each one has done after the person's life, okay, when their when their day is done. Okay? If the work which a man if the work which any man has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved. That line is key. Right? He will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Okay? So he himself will be saved, but through fire. So, just with these three texts, uh, Old Testament and two from the New Testament. Uh, the first one where we're praying for the deceased, the other two where there's a, this idea of, of paying our debt uh, to avoid prison uh, in Matthew 5 and here in the first letter to the Corinthians, uh, paying our debt through fire, our purification through fire. So this brings us then to what we now believe as Catholics. What is purgatory all, or, all about? Purgatory is a gift of God's mercy. And it's, it's a, a chance that we have to accept God's mercy after this life. When we see our lives as they are before God, when we see our sins as they are before God, we see the reality of our hearts as, 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 as it stands before God. There's no excuses, there's no I didn't know, there's no, you just see the reality of who God is, the reality of who you are. Now, there can be different reactions to that because it's, it's, not, it's not all always taken for granted that people actually want heaven. It sounds so, it sounds, we would, of course everyone wants heaven, but maybe they don't because if they did, if people really wanted heaven, why not give God more time or all your time? If you really wanted heaven, why do we do things we know are wrong? You know, if we, it sounds obvious, of course everyone wants heaven, but, but do we really? Are we willing to actually give anything in order to get heaven? Rather than just kind of presuming heaven. So, as I stand before God and see my soul as it is, I might say, well, God, look, you weren't there to help me. You left me alone. It was, it was the situation, my circumstances, the parents, the circle of friends that I had, the area of town that I lived in, fell into all this lifestyle that, I, that, that, that shouldn't have happened. But God, it was your fault. It was your fault. You didn't help me. Okay, so I reckon we can actually blame God or we can have maybe have, have had difficult experiences and say, I will never forgive the people from the north side, the east side, the west side, across the river, wherever it may be, the Protestants and the Muslims. I'll never forgive X, Y, or Z for what they did to me, the mother-in-law, you know, all these kind of things. I'll never forgive. I will not forgive. I will not forgive them and get into heaven. I don't want it. 
Now, if we outright would rather hold on to our hatred, hold on to our unforgiveness, than forgive and enter heaven, that's called hell. But we chose it. That's the really interesting thing that the, the, the scripture is, is clear about, now, or, or the catechism is clear about. Hell is chosen. Hell isn't inflicted. Hell isn't a condemnation. It's chosen. It's a, again, such an interesting concept. Because you'd say, why would anybody choose it? Well, <laughs> again, look at, look at the world around us. Why would people choose to do things that they know hurt other people? But they do. All the time. So it's not automatic that we, autom that we choose what's good or we choose what's true or we choose what's just. We don't. Read the newspaper. So, but it may also be as, that as I'm, I'm before God there on the day of my judgment, I might say, look, Lord, Lord I, I want heaven, but I'm not ready. I, remember, keep, keep in mind, to see, we can't get into heaven with, with any remnant of sin at all. You can't get into heaven and kind of be half, a half-baked saint. You know what I mean? You're, you can't bring sin into heaven. So either you're perfect or you're not. Either you're purified or you're not. Now, some might want purification, but for those who do, they want it. They can be prayed for from here. There is a purification by fire uh, for those who want it. And then they will enter heaven, purified. And again, it, 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 we'd be so careful to understand this, like to not misunderstand God, that some say, well, like, you have to have a bit of suffering before you get into heaven. You have to suffer a bit. God doesn't, God doesn't care about us suffering. It's not the suffering that has any value. Suffering on its own is a consequence of sin, right? Consequences is, it's, it's a consequence of the fall. Suffering isn't good in and of itself. But, like we meditated a couple of weeks back, uh, any suffering offered through love is completely transformed. So a suffering in, in purgatory, it's not that we're, just, we're burning, and because we're burning, we're, get, we're becoming more, more sanctified. No, we're, we're atoning for our sins, right? And we're learning to love God. Something we should have learned here, but for whatever reason, we didn't. We held on to sin or whatever it may be. So in, in purgatory, we now get, this, that, get that chance, opportunity again, to learn to love God. And there is no greater... love revealed than through suffering. It's suffering that, that intensifies love, as the cross proves. It's love. Love is proven by suffering. So we, we grow in love through the sufferings that, that we have in purgatory. It's not like, once, you know, once you've suffered enough, I let you in. Once you've suffered a bit, because you know, you've done all sorts of bad things, so I'm going to make you burn for a bit. I'm not going to kill you. I'll just burn you. And then when you're kind of crispy, <laughs> right? We'll haul you in just before you die. Like, do you know what I mean? Just please, just don't misunderstand God. Don't misunderstand His fatherly heart. But in 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 purgatory, we will learn our need for God, and we will cry out to God, knowing that He's a loving God and a loving Savior. And in this, like, learning to rely on Him, yearning for Him, longing for Him, learning to love Him despite the surroundings, whatever they are. We don't really know exactly. I mean. It, when we try to understand purgatory, we, we, in biblical language, it speaks about a purifying fire, but again, you're a soul, so souls don't get burned. So uh, uh, it's, it can be difficult to, to describe or understand these things, but the point is that God is purifying us because he wants to let us into heaven. He wants us to be with him forever, and we cannot bring sin into heaven. And so, as I say, in Scripture, we can see that there is a place where souls go, where we can pray for them, where they are purified. So it's a gift of God's mercy. Purgatory is a gift of God's mercy. And so as we pray for the souls in purgatory, we remember that once they get to heaven, they can pray for us. This is the communion of saints. So it's a, a tradition that's probably somewhat dying but the idea of praying for the dead and the idea of, you know, uh, even I would have noticed the difference even 10 years ago when I was a younger priest, yeah, I'd get many more mass offerings, people just giving me whatever a stipend, uh, asking me to pray for, for the holy souls. You know, just pray for, just for the holy souls, for those who don't want to pray for them. And it's, it's a lovely idea, it's a beautiful tradition, you know, that then we're praying for those souls in, in, in purgatory, who then, when they get to heaven, 
There's nothing else to do. We pray for us, which I think is a fairly good investment. Like, they pray for us. And like I said this morning, I'm thinking of a particular situation where there's alcoholism in a family. So if you pray for like souls in purgatory who might have suffered from alcoholism, that they then, when they get to heaven, will intercede for our family, for our situation, for your friend, for the person that you know, for the person who's in addiction or whatever it may be, uh, and, and you're praying for a holy soul who, who had to go through that purification for that reason and is now in heaven, and is now interceding as a saint in heaven for that person, that family, that situation, because they've been there and they know that it's not good, it's a dead end, it doesn't lead to heaven, it doesn't lead to happiness. You know, so they've been like, and I think this is a beautiful communion of saints, which we will again see firsthand, God willing, when we get there and meet these, these people who we've prayed for and who have been praying for us for who knows, maybe decades or whatever it is by then. So there's a, just a whole realm of, uh, of spiritual realities that, that will, when the veil of this life is lifted and we see things as they truly are, it's going to be truly beautiful. So we ask the good Lord today, through the sacrifice of this Holy Mass, through our prayers, through our offered Holy Communion, Lord, release many souls from purgatory. Lord, purify their hearts, lift them out of the darkness that they are in. Lord Jesus, help them to love. Heal the wounds of addiction, of sin, of vice. Lord, help them to let go of all that holds them and binds them to this earth, that they may be ready for you and for the glories of heaven. Amen.